Hi, I'm Regine Basha. And I'm Natalie Basha. For the final episode in this pilot season of Kitchen Radio, we have a very special guest based in London, really an icon of the Middle Eastern and Jewish food world, Claudia Rodin. Since the late 60s, Claudia has written 20 influential books and has recently released a new edition of the Book of Jewish Food. But she calls herself more of a recipe collector, modestly, rather than a chef. Her writings are historical chronicles, not just of the recipes, but of the context from which they came, which makes her a unique figure that's been very influential to many cookbook writers since that time. We learned that though her childhood memories are from Egypt, she is actually from a prominent Aleppo family. So there are also interesting anecdotes about being a Syrian Jewish family in Cairo. She doesn't do social media, but you can find a lot of information on her and her books online. So, Claudia, can you tell us about this dish that you're making for us today? Uh, I'm making a pastry called konafa uh, that my mother used to make mm. all the time when we were in London, and we used to make in Egypt as well. And it is made with a fine vermicelli-type pastry uh, that a lot of Arab and, and, and Turkish and Greek uh, pastries are made of called kadaifi in in wow. Greece and kadaif in uh, in Turkey and it's also called kunefe mm. um, by Syrians. Uh, Claudia, I have a question for you. I'm a huge fan of kunefe. is probably my favorite my favorite dessert <laughs> on earth. It really, Regine can tell you, I am he obsessed makes it. with yeah. it. I'm <laughs> obsessed with it. But as you mentioned, there's so many different varieties of it. Uh, and different different names for it comes from different regions or done different ways. Um, and you mentioned that your version is made with cream in it instead of like a chewy white cheese. What what, yes. what is that? Why could the reason for that be? Well, I don't know. <laughs> and we didn't really realize that we were doing different from anybody else. Huh. Um, but um, but I do also make the one with cheese. And now I make it some a mixture of goat cheese and mozzarella uh people are finding all kinds of ways of of uh, reproducing the cheese we used to use but in egypt we only used the made the cream one and it's made with ground rice and milk oh ah, interesting yes. huh that's and, very different from the yeah, from the kanafe that you and i eat, eat, usually yes yeah. yeah did you make a creamy one I made a cheesy one. So I put in my in mine I put mozzarella, I put ricotta. Yeah. Um sometimes I put a little bit of cream cheese in there to make it extra creamy. Yeah. But always the mozzarella, you know, so that it has a yeah. string to give, to give some of the Now I'm wondering yeah. I made it with mozzarella and ricotta and as mm. well. And uh, but yes, now I thought maybe I should make it mozzarella only. We'll see. We'll that would be trying. delicious too. But uh, the mm. one, the cream one is what all my children, grandchildren love. And it really, uh, it is so important to us because my mother went on making it. I was going to ask you, in fact, um, you know, in mm. Egypt, in your childhood at the time, what, what what context would it be made in? Is this a sort of holiday dessert? Is it show up on the Shabbat table. What what childhood memories does it bring up for you? Uh, like a, in it a was seat? a tea time mm. um, pastry because for Shabbat, uh, as it's dairy, of course, right. we couldn't, except that we were not kosher. Mm. And mm -hmm. I really, people in Egypt were not, mm. and we were lax. Uh, we, the whole of my generation, I don't know, I don't know one person who at kosher i think that was strict probably i could say that was the same for our family in Baghdad too it wasn't really but even but i think quite secular people who mm -hmm. are religious in mm -hmm. Baghdad. Mm -hmm. i i think in egypt it's my grandparents okay and great uncles and mm -hmm. they all were Claudia, that that actually um, you started talking about something that I noticed in your books. You you often write these beautiful anecdotes about your family and your family life and your history. So can you tell us where you're, you know, kind of take us through the origin story of your family, where you guys came from and then ended, yes. how you ended up in London? Yes. 
Well, three of my grandparents came from um, Aleppo. Mm -hmm. And uh, they came uh, at the end of the 19th century. Actually, my father was conceived there and he he uh, was born in Cairo. And wow. his the family, they were already, he was the 10th. Wow. And they were all girls. And he was the last one, and he was a boy. Amazing. <laughs> wow. so he was much <laughs> desired and much loved. And um, uh, and so they were merchant families um, uh, who came because after the building of the Suez Canal, uh, it killed the trade, which was the caravan um, camel, the camel caravan sarai, um, uh, spice, trade. the spice trade. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was not the just spice, but they traded in all kinds of things, and all those things arrived by camel. Amazing, yeah. And um, and uh, but once the canal was built, uh, the trade ended, and so a lot of people migrated to Egypt. It was the nearest place. One of my grandfathers also came from Aleppo, Isaac Sassoon. Hmm. He was from a family that originated in uh, Iraq. Uh, That's right, and, so soon. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. and it was the family, he was one of the branches of the ones who also came to England eventually. Hmm. And his particular family had gone to, they were in India. That's right, uh, yes. Oh, wow. Mumbai. And so he was, he had a British passport. Mm. He was very proud of being British. The other family, my father's family, um, they were called Dweck. They were a uh, long time in Syria, forever, it seems, yes. we thought. Is this the family that uh, you had a, a grand rabbi, yes. your father's father, yes. Rabbi of Aleppo? Is yes. that right? He was the chief rabbi. Chief rabbi. We were very proud of that. Yeah. And I got his photo in the kitchen. Oh, we'll have to have a look <laughs> at that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that. And um, and uh, yes, they were a very, very extended family. Uh, as you can imagine, they were 10. And one of his sister actually had 18 children. So I had many, mm -hmm. many cousins. And... <laughs> But Amazing. we also had some more distant cousins or second cousins. And I just kept feeling everybody was my cousin at the time. They probably were. Some, <laughs> in some way, in some yeah. way or form. And, and so as you can guess, we did a lot of visiting. And whatever time of day, uh, it depended. And you would get, if you came at a certain time, you would get meze. You could get a coffee with some tiny pastry or a preserve or jam with the coffee. It's funny yeah. because Regina and I were talking about this before we went on this podcast, but we have a family friend who was like an aunt to us. Um, her name was Daisy. And exactly what you described, you know, open house every Saturday, going in, plates yeah. of food, metze, fruit, cheese, coffee, tea, whatever. Yeah. That's exactly okay. what it was. And and she was our our, our Aunt Daisy was um Iraqi. She and was so you're describing yeah. a scene that is just for both of us. Yeah, we grew up around this. Evocative. The whole community was a, coming in yes. and out all the yeah. time, yes. all day long. And kids to you know, yes. generate intergenerations. They were he incredible. Was really, he became the sort of uh uh patriarch of the family. The Jews left Egypt in 1956. It was when uh, uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser had nationalized the canal. That's right. And the canal had been built by a French company and a British company together. And uh, uh, so they owned it. They owned the canal and they manned the canal. And they got all the revenue from all the ships that passed. Yes. And so uh, he uh, nationalized without giving compensation even. And so France and Britain decide to attack Egypt to go to war and and regain the canal also. I, yes. It was a big mistake 
And the mistake also, they asked Israel to help them. Yes. And Israel was nearby and they, at uh, the French and English attacked by air and Israel attacked by the sea. Israel was already at war with Egypt, or yes. rather Egypt was at war with Israel, because it went to war as soon as Israel declared itself a state. Yes, we know uh, this yes, but story. It was, they were at war, but they never touched the Jews, because the Jews weren't Israel. In they Cairo, you mean? In Cairo or yeah. in Egypt, mm. because they saw them as their Jews. Uh, but this was too much for them to be attacked. I see. So after this event... They themselves attacked by Israel. Okay. Uh, they had attacked Israel. Right, before. right. And so... It was a point of shame. What? Yes, yeah. but anger, total anger. Mm -hmm. But also, they had already wanted to... There had been violence against the British because it was a British protectorate. Uh, and but so uh, so uh, uh, Jews felt the war was not going to end with Israel, uh, and they knew the Egyptians were not bad people compared to the way the Jews in Iraq were treated at one time. I do hear that actually when people turned yeah. on them violently. The yeah, I don't think anybody had any experience of any violence. And I must say, because I left earlier hmm. to, I was in Paris and then here, uh, I never have any, not a single memory of anybody uh, saying anything hurtful yeah. or mentioning hmm. Jews in any other way than respect. So I can't wow. feel... Of course, other people would have another experience. Yes. And at the end, when the end came, they had to leave. It was traumatic for many. There is a story that appears in your book, which thankfully is being reprinted, right? You have now the book of Jewish cookies. Yes, because it's been its 25, 25th, 25th anniversary. anniversary. There are so many show, yeah. incredible stories. And, and one really stood out for me. Um, regarding what happened to you when you went back. Do you mind if I if I read it no, out no. loud? <laughs> okay, okay, here it is. When I went back to Cairo after 30 years absence, I found Musa's name still on the warehouse. That That is your uncle, correct? Yes. As I stood a good distance away in the Khan, the market, looking at it with a beating heart someone came out and asked if i was a relative of musa duek a large crowd old men in kaftans young ones in jeans women in shadors gathered around from neighboring stores to see me they offered me coffee an old man brought out photographs of my family i went to visit latifa's tomb in the jewish cemetery in the desert outside of cairo Bedouins with sheep and goats who have made their homes in nearby mausoleums rushed to take down their washing and to tidy up. And I was invited as a relative to drink tea in one of those mausoleums. And another had been turned into a bakery with a stone oven. And I was offered some of the bread. And for me, I knew the family. Incredible. The name. What yes. a story. Uh, yeah. Of the family on the tomb. Yeah. The it's, mausoleum. It's just such a poignant moment. I can't yeah. imagine breaking bread with Bedouins yeah. and, and having this experience of people bringing you yeah. photographs of your own family yeah. and welcoming you in this way. So, Claudia, I wanted to ask you, uh, there's a line in one of your books that says, Syrian Jewish cooking has survived in an extraordinary way in communities abroad. Uh, can you explain why that is? How, how and why has it survived so well? Yes, I think, uh, first of all, because the Syrians were very proud of their food. And as you said, uh, it was the, the pearl of the Arab kitchen. It was the best food of Syria, yeah. mm. the most refined. And it was the best food of the Arab world. That's what they thought anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, 
And they also thought they were the best people as well. <laughs> <laughs> but then everybody else thought they were the best people. Yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but they somehow have uh, managed to stay together as communities. It's true. And uh, it was, I realized when um, the Jewish Chronicle had a, an article about my family, about me, Mm. And they had the photographs of my great grandfather, the chief rabbi, and my grandfather with his tarbush, the chief rabbi with his resplendent turban and and kaftan, and and uh, medals given to him by the Sultan Abdul Hamid, and uh, mm. and also a photograph of me, a big one in color, in the garden with my two daughters when they were young. I think, you know, the eldest might have been 18 or something, or no, 16 and 19 or something. And uh, and uh, it was quite a beautiful photograph. But the next day, I got phone calls and and uh, from New York, from Mexico, people wanted uh, uh, my daughters in marriage with their son. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we were really a mosaic. Uh, in sorry. Cairo yes our community in Cairo actually in Egypt I should say our Jewish community in Egypt uh, was a mosaic of families who had come from all over the Ottoman world and also from around the Mediterranean so people came from Italy from uh, from all over and to open an office in Alexandria or Cairo or, mm. and uh, so we were such a mixed community and we just took each other for granted and they just didn't see that it was unusual even. But it's when uh, everybody left and it was the time when I started collecting recipes and uh, I was going to women who were, I was then 20 and then I went on for about 10 years to collect um, but at first for myself and my family, and then I decided to, to do a book. But I was asking all these people who were leaving, there had been 80,000 Jews. And for 10 years, they were moving around and passing by London. Some of them stayed in London, were able to stay. And I was asking everybody for recipes. And uh, people were so glad to give recipes. In Egypt, they never exchanged. Hmm. They stayed only in the families. Mm -hmm. Passed down in the, in the families. There hadn't been a single cookbook. Nobody ever had seen a cookbook or a printed recipe. Wow. Sure, it's all oral. Right? All it's oral. All, yeah. And in the family only, from mother to daughter. Yeah. And so people were telling me, oh, this is recipe comes from my grandmother in Izmir, from my mother in Salonika from uh, Livorno, oh, my from all kinds of places. So <laughs> I realized, hey, who we were, there, we there were mixed. Go. And of course we were Syrian, but all the others were there as well. I would like to mention maybe that one recipe that I was Please trying do. to wonder why, why did it come about? Because one lady, actually, she was the grandmother of my sister-in-law. She came over. She's called Iris Galante. And she came from, <laughs> from uh, Aleppo. And she gave uh, me that orange cake that's become fashionable all over the world. Orange cake. Oh, yes, yes, yes. yes. This yes. is cake. the cake that's in now, now in all the cookbooks, now all over social media. I know the cake that you're talking about. Yes, but <laughs> the thing was, uh, I started thinking late. I haven't put it in my book because I wasn't thinking then. Uh, why? It's because people have told me. Um, so I realized that the Jewish community of Syria was also had some Jews who came from Spain. And they yes. had come. They were the grandees of, uh, of Syria. They were called medias because they cooked their their courgettes open, not whole. Media. The, their, oh, like medias and cut in half. 
Yeah, right. they were called Metias because they had come from Livorno. It was Italians cooked it, cooked their courgettes. Uh, they stuffed it uh, in my half. And so I did realize that she and my own aunt, I had an Aunt Regine. Uh, <laughs> I read that in your book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> she had a, a, she was, her mother was Abu Lafia, her father was the Picciotto. Mm. And the De Picciottos, they were Picciottos from Spain who had moved to Portugal uh, at the time of the Inquisition and yes. then eventually had gone as had been forced to convert. The family had gone to Livorno where they allowed to reconvert to Judaism. But so I realized that a lot of her recipes were not the typical Same. Syrian. And then mm. when I started traveling in Italy, I saw, wow, they are from Livorno. And I've met now people, Jews from Livorno in Italy. <laughs> and uh, and so that uh, orange and almond cake, yes, has a history, a long history, and now is so fashionable. That is unbelievable. What I'm laughing because I've made this cake so many times and I didn't know this. I didn't know the background of this cake. Yeah. Yes. I mean, do you think now if one were to go to Livorno, would this cake be in a bakery perhaps? And maybe, no one would know that it has this not. Jewish origin. Probably. Yeah. I mean, the next time I have an orange cake, I, 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 I'm <laughs> going to close my eyes and, you know, just go down this road. This I'll is have amazing. to make another one in honor of this conversation. So, Claudia, last question, something that we're really curious about. Um, obviously, you are so rehearsed and you have so much collected and preserved from so many different Jewish communities around the world. Um, is there a stone unturned? I mean, is is there a region of Jewish uh, culinary history that you still want to explore or uncover some more? There is a lot, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. But first of all, yes. I um, uh, because even the Jewish call whenever before when I was researching the book, every time I met Jews they would say there's no such thing as Jewish food, <laughs> and even in Israel people would laugh at me, you know when I was went there to research and they would say please please Claudia do something else a love story crime novel <laughs> you know food you know uh, there. Even the Jews, yes, didn't think there was such a thing. Since then, I was giving a talk, um, Jewish Book Week in a restaurant, and then a whole table, I was saying, um, uh, yes, I met the Jews of Sarajevo. They have a particular cuisine that it was uh, 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 Iberian, but different. Interesting. They were in Sarajevo. Wow. And then I said there was this different one. Then they said, we are from Afghanistan. Mm. And we had a whole cuisine that was Jewish. And because wow. we came from Iran. Oh, yeah. And they came to okay. Afghanistan, but they were different even from Iran. Sure. And so hmm. uh, they said, they gave me also, they had music that their songs and they had poems and you know there were cultures everywhere but i did try my best <laughs> but there are but even in the same country there are different cuisines of like course. in india yeah. yes of course there's the different communities some of them came from iraq yeah some yeah. of them came from portugal directly to goa, goa. and then to mm -hmm. And I've met now the people from Goa when I was in India. Amazing. And they shouted at me. I came to give a talk at a festival. <laughs> and they said, we make the orange cake. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll get with the orange cake. Oh, no. oh my gosh. <laughs> Everyone's claiming it. Yeah. So there is. It continues. Uh, and even in when I was speaking at the Sephardic synagogue here, uh, somebody said, you left out the food of the Jews of the Jewish quarter of Cairo. And I said, he said, for instance, the sofrito we did. And it is, my mother made it with chicken and it was flavored with turmeric and cardamom and garlic and and uh, and it was chicken and, and little potatoes. And, 
And then uh, the person said, we never had chicken. We just did the potatoes. It was also frito. We did on Friday night. And Shabbat, the, some people did ferik, and it was chicken with, with frike. Now it said it as frike, because it comes from Lebanon, and it's the Syrian spelling. And uh, no, we did full medames for Friday night. Full medames, yeah. My so father spoke, uh, used to speak a lot about full medames. Yeah. We, oh. we ate it a little bit. Grandma, yeah. grandma would make it yeah. for us sometimes. Yeah. But we knew it was Lebanese. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So when you go and tour and give talks, there's always somebody in the audience who has has to have the, something the to say. Word. They, yes, they sometimes bring a, they, I've often had a letter, a, a page handwritten by them of a dish that their mother made. Of course, the Jews always say their mother's was best. <laughs> Your work navigates a, a tricky nostalgia, no? And it's, a, yeah. and it's, as you know, cultural theorist Ella Shohat, who we know, uh, calls it taboo memories, and it's it's because of the rupture, the rupture of you know having left this heartbreaking moment of um, leaving a millennial long history of integration into these countries, and I'm just fascinated with with how you you've navigated that in your storytelling, um, and how through your work you've reseeded. Jewish presence where it was lost. Mm -hmm. It's very, it's, it's just so profound. And I wondered if you can speak a little bit about your audience, like the Middle Eastern audience and how yeah. they have received that. Uh, in countries, I've just received many awards, <laughs> but one from Turkey, well deserved. where I got just an award from the Chefs Association there um, for helping them. And I'm I'm doing a lot with them and in Turkey. In Turkey. And I've been many times for conference and things. And and recently I went to one and we went to a chef, a female chef, because now there are female chefs. They never were before. Mm. They weren't allowed in the kitchen. And uh, she said, you know, we my mother cooks from your book. And I learned from your book. Oh, that's incredible. That was <laughs> incredible. But in Egypt, for the Chefs Association to ask me to come to tell them what they should be cooking. Wow. And um, I got and, chills, um, literally. It was, yes. <laughs> and, you know, and, and they're very humorous. So we had so many laughs, so many laughs. And, you know, I had young journalists coming uh, saying, what did the, what was it like when the Jews were there? They were young, they never saw any. And then uh, and then what was the, the Jewish dishes? And they put it in the newspaper. Hmm. But I knew that a newspaper used recipes from my book. Every week they put a recipe uh, because they didn't have recipe books. There wasn't a single Egyptian cookbook. They came yes. after. Yes. There was one who came after we left and it was somebody who studied um, cooking in a school in England, and it was all European <laughs> uh, dishes. That was the main book afterwards. Of course, now there are hundreds. But also, I was looking up my building mm -hmm. to remember the Bela building in Zamalek, uh, to not make a mistake about when it was built or what number. And I looked at it, and then there's a story, and it says, the owner who uh, built the building would have been very happy to know that Claudia Roten, the food writer who wrote the book, was born, lived there. I wasn't I mean, actually born in the building, mm. but uh, um, but so that was um, that was it's come full circle. Uh, yes, and and um, now I get. A lot of Egyptians, but a lot of people, you know, for instance, one of this um, Facebook things that people have started here of people who have memories of Egypt. Mm -hmm. That's quite different from my friends whom I've known for many years who are all sending each other things. Um, this is something other. 
but somehow it came to me, although I'm not, I don't do Facebook, it came to me. And every day there is something. And now Muslims in Egypt have started being part of it and saying, here's the photograph of this thing. It's still there, you know. Here is this. And from e from Egypt, they're yeah. posting yeah. Jewish sites yeah. that are still there. And uh, also they are remembering. Yeah. We used to, my father used to work with somebody called, and uh, so there is that. And now I keep being invited to go back. Yeah. But just lately, I didn't feel like it because it's different now uh, because of Israel and the anger with the young people and all that. I don't know whether it's the embassy or the foreign officer. Okay. And he came here and he said, would you go back to Syria? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> a lot will have to happen. I, yeah. are, uh, I, don't, I said, no, we'd never go back when, uh, because he said, come back for, would you come to a visit for a holiday? No, <laughs> we wouldn't come back when, uh, because it, for us, we had memories that we never went there, but we knew all about it from our parents and grandparents because they adored Syria. They only came for business, mm. you see, but for them, Syria was, you know, but, uh, but uh, well, as long as Bashar al-Assad is there. Oh, yeah. And yeah. The, the ask another Syrian who's not Jewish. And yeah. They'll have yeah. the same answer, you know. I mean, exactly. Just, yeah. I mean, that's the tricky nostalgia part. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But I'm, it's not about going back necessarily, is it? It's 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 really about maintaining. You know, I like to call it resistance of a amnesia, of yes. an amnesia of our presence there and our oh, yes. uh, time there. And yes. it's really not that long oh, yeah. ago, and so on. Oh yes, and things are happening. Yeah. I know in Morocco there is a museum of. Um, a Jewish museum in Casablanca. Mm. Somebody called Eli Cohen ran it. I met him when I was in Morocco. And also um, there is, for instance, the Minister of Finance, who is called, I think he's called Azuelos, means in Spanish blue eyes, <laughs> uh, huh. uh, because he has blue eyes. Uh, he has started... Um, a music festival in Esawira. Esawira used to be Mogador, was full of Jews, full right. of synagogue. And the music festival there, Israelis come, Jews come from everywhere, and Muslims all play together Andalusian music. Natalie, we're going. Yeah, I want to go. <laughs> oh, we're all yes, all going. Like we're going to podcast live from this from this yes, event. Um, wow, that is something special. Wow, yeah. Claudia, I can't even. Yeah. I don't even know where to begin to thank you for this. This is one of. I mean, truly the most fascinating conversation we've had. Mm -hmm. um, the wealth of your knowledge and and the the breadth of 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 what you've studied and really the treasure that your books are, you know, collecting all of this for, you know, the benefit of everyone else. It's really, thank you yeah. so much. I mean, thank I, you. I, it's not even, it's, it's an international treasure, yeah. you know, yes. I mean, the thing is, across I so many cultures me because I was so fascinated and it was sort of my culture, my parents' culture that I wanted to say for us. But you started at yeah. 20. I mean, you know, yeah. And yeah, now you, I'm you, had, you had no idea at the time, right? Yeah. How it yeah. would snowball into this amazing life of stories and interchange. Oh, and yes. It's staggering, really. Thank you so much, yeah. Claudia. Thank you for being it's interested. It's such an honor. And, and it's such a joy to meet you. Thanks for listening. And join us again next time on Kitchen Radio.